When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they did so intending to smash in one single blow America's resolution and its inability to retaliate. They failed miserably on both counts. The Japanese sank or badly damaged seven antiquated American battleships, but since they were lost in harbor, many of their crews were saved and all but two of the ships were salvaged. The raid also left most of Pearl Harbor's shore installations intact. Most important of all, the violation of United States territory united the nation behind the declaration of war on Japan. The 1927 vintage Lexington and Saratoga and the much more modern Enterprise were out of port during the raid and were therefore untouched. By 1942, they were joined by the Enterprise's sister ship, Yorktown, and the newly completed Hornet. These carriers were well fitted to take the offensive, for they carried a large number of effective fighters and dive bombers. The Commander-in-Chief of the Central Pacific Fleet in 1942 was Admiral Chester William Nimitz. Within weeks of his appointment, this great leader transformed the morale of his men, infecting them all with his own confidence in a final Allied victory. Following his appointment, Nimitz decided to mount a series of raids on Japanese-held islands in the Pacific. On separate occasions, his fleet attacked Japanese bases in the Marshall and Gilbert Islands. Then, in March, he took his fleet to attack Wake and Marcus Islands. These strikes were by no means small, and the damage inflicted on all targets throughout the first few months of 1942 was considerable. One nightmare of pre-war Japanese military strategists had been the possibility of an attack by aircraft from United States carriers on Japan's home islands. Their worst fears were fulfilled when, on the 18th of April, 1942, 16 United States Army B-25 Mitchells struck Tokyo. They were led by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. What was even more surprising was the fact that these 12-ton aircraft, normally land-based, took off from the decks of the United States carrier Hornet. The very heart of Tokyo was bombed, and although the damage was slight, the effect on the Japanese nation was enormous. The horror of the Japanese people led to the commander of the Japanese fleet Admiral Yamamoto being granted permission for his grand plan. A final showdown between the United States and Japanese fleets. What Yamamoto did not include in his grand plan, however, was the fact that these plans would soon be known by his enemies. 
By the end of April, American intelligence were able to decrypt 85% of Japanese signals. This alone would give the Americans an incalculable advantage in the Pacific. Intelligence had been coming in, indicating a major offensive was being planned in the Southwest Pacific. The Japanese plan was to isolate Australia from the United States of America, first by seizing Port Moresby and establishing a seaplane base at the tiny island of Tulagi in the Solomons. Then they would take key points in New Caledonia, the New Hebrides and Fiji. To mount this offensive, the Japanese had assembled an invasion force, which included a formidable striking force of six modern destroyers, two heavy cruisers, and the large fleet carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku. The Americans acted quickly, and the hunt was on. Admiral Nimitz ordered a three-part naval force to the Coral Sea. In tactical command of the whole force was Rear Admiral Frank J. Fletcher on the carrier Yorktown, which was to lead Task Force 17. It was on the 7th of May that the two enemies eventually made contact, but both sides suffered equally from errors and accidents. At 0815 hours, a United States reconnaissance plane reported seeing two Japanese carriers and four large cruisers just north of Misima Island, near the tip of New Guinea. Admiral Fletcher on the Yorktown, convinced that he had found the main Japanese force, launched his full-scale attack. 93 aircraft took off from the carriers Yorktown and Lexington. In fact, the reconnaissance pilot had only spotted one of the Japanese support groups, two cruisers and two destroyers. The day was saved by the sharp eyes of Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, commander of the Lexington's dive bomber squadron. While on the way to attack the support group, Hamilton drifted off course to the east. He spotted a much more important force. A covering force for the Port Moresby invasion commanded by Rear Admiral Arimoto Goto on the carrier Shoho. The American planes were redirected. At first, the highly maneuverable Japanese carrier managed to dodge the American attacks but Shoho was eventually overwhelmed and sunk. Meanwhile, Fletcher had directed the Australian-American force under Rear Admiral Crace against the Port Moresby invasion group. Crace's force was attacked by land-based Japanese aircraft from Rabul and later by United States B-26s from Australia mistaking them for Japanese. Luckily, neither attack was successful. On the morning of the 8th, the two carrier forces finally located each other. After the loss of Shoho, both sides now had two carriers each, but the Japanese only had 95 operational aircraft against the Americans 118. Shortly after 0900 hours, both sides' aircraft were launched and the Battle of the Coral Sea commenced. The Japanese attack inflicted significant damage on both the Yorktown and Lexington. Yorktown managed, with clever maneuvering, to avoid the Japanese torpedoes, but bombs exploding in the water nearby badly damaged her below the waterline. Another bomb went down through four decks, where, consequently, it exploded, killing 37 of her crew and wounding 33. The Lexington, bigger and less maneuverable than the Yorktown, was hit by two torpedoes as well as several bombs and was listing badly on the port side. Meanwhile, United States pilots were launching an assault on the Japanese carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku. Zuikaku, the flagship, was hidden by a rainstorm, so the full weight of the American attack fell on her sister ship, Shokaku. The few defending Zeros were able to force the first wave of American devastators to launch their torpedoes too far away to make any hits. 
But the second wave of dauntless dive bombers that followed were much more successful. One dauntless pilot, Lieutenant John Powers, had vowed to sink an enemy carrier unaided. During the attack on Shokaku, he swooped in a daring low-level attack, releasing his bomb a mere 19 meters above the carrier's deck. In the resulting explosion, Powers crashed to his death in the sea. But the damage to the flight deck, caused as a result of his bomb, was so severe that the carrier's aircraft were no longer able to take off or land. Further bombs completed the job. Shokaku had to withdraw from the battle. No longer with air cover, Inuyi had to call off the whole operation and withdraw his invasion force. The Battle of the Coral Sea was thus a strategic success for the Americans. The Coral Sea had been the first sea battle ever where two fleets had engaged on the high seas without being in sight of one another and relying entirely upon aircraft to strike the enemy. The Americans were quick to master this new type of naval warfare and were ready to use it again at a later date. That date was not far away. On the 20th of May, 1942, Allied listening stations around the Pacific picked up a lengthy radio signal in code from Admiral Yamamoto to his fleet. The message was relayed to the United States Combat Intelligence Unit at Pearl Harbor and deciphered. It was revealed that the Japanese Navy was about to mount a powerful attack on the mid-Pacific atoll of Midway with a secondary diversionary attack on the Aleutians further north. The 4th of June and the United States fleet's main prey, the Japanese carrier striking force under Admiral Nagumo was zigzagging through dense fog completely oblivious of Fletcher's fleet lying in wait for them. In the early hours of the morning, they reached calm and clear conditions. At 04.30 hours, Nagumo launched his first strike. 108 aircraft took off from the carriers to attack Midway. They were immediately spotted on Midway's radar. The Zero fighters appeared from behind the clouds and the island's defenses went into action immediately. Midway's fighters went up to engage the enemy. Considerable damage was inflicted on the airfield buildings and garrison, but the airstrip remained intact. A few transport aircraft were damaged, but most of the fighter and bomber aircraft were in the air and out of the way during the attack. As the fires burned over Midway, the extent of the damage was surveyed. Nagumo was now in a quandary. His first attack had not knocked out the airfield as planned. It was still operational. A second air attack was needed. The Japanese commander ordered his second wave torpedo bombers to be rearmed with bombs for another attack on Midway. At 0728 hours, 15 minutes after the commander had ordered his aircraft below, one of Nagumo's search planes spotted 10 United States warships some 335 kilometers northeast of the Japanese carriers. Ironically, this plane had taken off 30 minutes late that morning. Had it taken off on time, it would have spotted the Americans 30 minutes earlier and got the news back before the torpedo bombers had been sent below. If this had been the case, Nagumo would almost have certainly sent his aircraft against the United States fleet and the course of the battle and of the entire war in the Pacific might have been very different. As it was, Nagumo was yet again in a quandary. Should he turn his attention to the United States ships or concentrate on Midway? He halted the rearming. But there was one more question for the Japanese commander to worry about. Did the United States force include carriers? His worst fears were realized when at 08.20 hours, 
a scout reported that the enemy was accompanied by what looked to be a carrier. The news could not have reached Nagumo at a worse moment. His first wave was just arriving back from the attack on Midway and had to land to refuel. What bombers he did have available would have to fly without fighter escort and were only armed with bombs and not torpedoes. By 0918 hours, the Japanese flight decks were full of aircraft, some now rearmed, others being refueled. The carriers were like floating bombs. Also unbeknown to Nagumo, Fletcher had launched his aircraft and was about to attack at any moment. News that airborne Catalinas had spotted the Japanese carrier fleet had reached Fletcher that morning at 0534 hours. Fletcher had ordered the Hornet and the Enterprise ahead to attack, while the Yorktown waited to retrieve the spotter planes. At 0700 hours, the Hornet and Enterprise, still a long way off from the Japanese carriers, launched their aircraft, 152 of them. They were aware that the Japanese were landing aircraft after the attack on Midway, but they were taking a big gamble, launching from such a dangerous long range. Yet these men were to make, probably, the most decisive naval airstrike in history. However, what these pilots didn't know was that Nagumo had changed course when he decided to reload his aircraft. As a result, the first aircraft had difficulty locating their prey. At 0928 hours, the first United States torpedo planes from the Hornet appeared over the Japanese fleet, diving into attack. The Japanese launched their Zeros, attempting to drive the bombers away from the ships, and there was a fierce and bloody fight in the skies. By 0945 hours, another wave of torpedo bombers arrived from the Enterprise, followed by another wave from the Yorktown at 10.15. The American losses were high. The Zeros and anti-aircraft fire from the ships were taking their toll. Lieutenant Commander McCluskey scanned the sparkling blue Pacific northeast of Midway Island. He was leading 33 dive bombers from the Enterprise and was lost. He needed to make a decision. Where he had expected to find the enemy, there was nothing, and his planes would soon have to turn back for lack of fuel. But McCluskey had a hunch. He decided to continue his search a little further west and the gamble paid off. Nimitz later described this as the most important decision of the battle. A few minutes later, McCluskey spotted the wake of an enemy destroyer and followed it. Just after 10 hundred hours, he found the Japanese carriers. The first waves of bombers which had attacked previously had suffered disastrously. Most of them had been shot down by the Zeros, but this first attack had let McCluskey's dive bombers come in unnoticed. Joined by a further 17 dive bombers from the Yorktown, McCluskey could not have arrived at a better moment. The decks of the Japanese carriers were crammed with nearly 100 aircraft as they prepared for their own strike against the United States carriers. 
All of them were loaded with explosives and high octane fuel. The tiniest spark would turn them into floating infernos. As the Japanese carriers were turning into the wind to launch their aircraft, 50 United States dive bombers were hurtling in from the sky. The first hits turned the carriers Akagi, Kaga and Soryu into exploding torches. One Japanese sailor later recalled, the terrifying scream of the dive bombers reached me first, followed by the crashing explosion of a direct hit. It was a blinding flash and then a second explosion, much louder than the first. Within minutes, most of the Japanese first air fleet had been wiped out. The fourth carrier, Hiryu, was saved and tried a desperate counterattack. At 1,200 hours, she launched her aircraft against the Yorktown. During this stage of the battle, despite desperate maneuver, the Yorktown took several direct hits. By 1440 hours, following another direct hit from a torpedo, the Yorktown was so badly crippled that Fletcher had no other alternative than to abandon her. He handed command over to Admiral Spruance, commander of Task Force 16. At 1700 hours, Spruance launched his aircraft from the Hornet and Enterprise. Their mission, to attack the Hiryu. The attack took the Japanese by surprise. Once again, the aircraft were on deck as they were preparing for a twilight raid on the remaining American carriers. Four direct hits set her decks ablaze. The Hirayu was crippled beyond repair. During the night of the 4th of June, whilst the United States crews on board Hornet and Enterprise prepared their aircraft for the next day's battle, the Japanese carriers Soryu and Kaga sank to the bottom of the ocean. Shortly afterwards, reports came back that the remaining Japanese carrier, Akagi, had followed the same fate as the other three. Four of Japan's finest carriers had gone. Prior to 1942 and the victories at sea, the war in the Pacific had not been going too well for the Americans, but this was beginning to change. In Papua New Guinea and at Guadalcanal, the Allies had continuously harassed the Japanese, which prolonged any plans they had for invading Port Moresby, which would give them a stepping stone to mainland Australia. By 1943, it was clear that there was much fighting to be done before Japan could be brought to her knees. It was also clear that the Pacific must be the decisive theater for that fighting, since the supply problems of supporting a major offensive in China were too great, and there was little likelihood of a major thrust into Burma for some time to come. The United States fleet continued to harass the Japanese shipping convoys to the Aleutians, thus cutting their supply routes, which left them no alternative other than to rely on supplies being brought in by submarine which proved ineffective. The knock-on effect was that the Japanese had to withdraw from the islands, leaving the door open for the Americans to take over. United States amphibious craft finally landed on the island of Kiska in August 1943. 
General MacArthur had pressed for an invasion of Rabul as being the key objective in the Solomons, and he put forward a plan. American and Australian forces were to make a series of landings on the New Guinea coast, whilst other Allied troops would begin a series of what became known as island hopping, starting from Guadalcanal. American bombers continued to pound the Japanese supply convoys. On New Guinea, the progress was protracted. This was deep, dense jungle territory, a favorite of the Japanese soldier, and the Allies met with fierce resistance and were also hampered by fever and sickness amongst their troops. Progress on New Guinea was slow. The landings by amphibious craft would continue on this peninsula for almost a year, the last of which took place in June 1944. The first stepping stone to Rabul would be New Georgia, but as the Americans prepared for the invasion, their bases were attacked by Japanese bombers. In April 1943, the Americans did score one major success against Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese in the Southwest Pacific. Intelligence intercepted a signal that he was about to do a tour of inspection on the island of Bougainville. His Mitsubishi bomber was attacked and shot down. There were no survivors. The death of Yamamoto was a major blow to the morale of the Japanese. On the 21st of June, 1943, American troops invaded New Georgia. They initially met with little resistance on the beach. In a bid to transport supplies, the Japanese started to run what became known as the Tokyo Express. These were warships instead of transport ships, packed with supplies and reinforcements. On many occasions, mostly at night, the United States fleet intercepted the convoys, but Allied losses were high, the Japanese being far superior in their night fighting techniques. Meanwhile, the fighting continued at Munda Airfield, and it took another five weeks to finally capture it, and another month or more to secure the island. Bougainville was a stronghold for the Japanese, that was until the 1st of November 1943, when MacArthur's troops invaded. The Japanese 17th Army of 33,000 men defending the island fought hard and relentlessly for every inch. Matters were made even worse when Japanese reinforcements were landed by the Tokyo Express. Further east, under the command of Chester Nimitz, the new major Allied offensive against mainland Japan had begun. The Gilbert Islands were the first objective. On the 10th of November, Nimitz and his fleet set sail from Pearl Harbor. By the 13th of November, the carrier-borne aircraft were bombarding the island defenses, clearing a path for the amphibious landings. The Japanese could not hold out for any length of time, and subsequently the operation was wound up within a few days. In Tarawa and Makin, however, things were very different. Both islands had been heavily fortified by the Japanese, and the United States Marines suffered heavy casualties. On Tarawa in particular, the landings were slow and treacherous some soldiers having to abandon their craft and wade ashore by foot, making them slow and easy targets for the Japanese. The Japanese by this time had no hope of rescue, and they fought relentlessly for the next four days, down to the last man. Casualties were subsequently very high. 3,500 Americans and over 5,500 Japanese lost their lives. <laughs> 
With Tarawa and Makin now secured, Nimitz turned his attention towards the next objective, the Marshall Islands. On the 4th of December, aircraft from the United States carrier fleet attacked the islands of Bajalin and Wachi. In the process, the USS Lexington was damaged by torpedo fire. The amphibious assault on the islands took place one month later, on the 1st of February, 1944. The Japanese now found themselves spread too thinly over too great a distance, but nevertheless they fought ruthlessly. Within three days, 8,000 Japanese had died at a cost of 2,000 American lives. By the end of the month, the atoll at Eniwetok was also secure in American hands. Meanwhile, on Bougainville, McCarthy's men were desperately trying to open an airstrip, which they finally completed and opened on the 9th of December, 1943. Six days later, they launched a preliminary assault on New Britain. Back on Bougainville, the Americans were continuously counterattacked by the Japanese, with even more reinforcements being landed. By the end of March 1944, however, the Japanese gave up the struggle and began to withdraw inland. By this time, MacArthur had control of the Admiralty Islands, one step further towards his objective of Rabul, which was now isolated. He turned his attention towards the Philippines, the jewel in his crown. With the Marshall Islands now secure, Nimitz, meanwhile, was on the move once again with one of the largest naval forces ever assembled. His objective was the Marianas, a distance of 6,000 miles away. On the 15th of June, 1944, United States Marines made their first landings in Saipan. In the island garrison were 32,000 determined Japanese soldiers. As the Marines came ashore in their buffalo tracked amphibians, they knew the defenses would be heavy. But the Japanese had also foreseen these landings on the Marianas and hatched a plan to intercept the massive United States carrier force as it lay in wait off the islands. Again, American intelligence beat the Japanese, and Nimitz launched his aircraft against them. This evolved into what became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, the American fighters and dive bombers pounded the Japanese fleet and aircraft. Two carriers were sunk and 220 aircraft were shot down. The Japanese, believing that their aircraft were safe and had probably landed on Guam to refuel, remained in the vicinity to await their return, only to be attacked once more by Nimitz, losing yet another carrier as a result. Only 29 American aircraft were lost. So, the strain of continuous battle on the pilots was immense, resulting in many collisions as they landed back on deck. On Saipan, the Americans had gradually been wearing down Japanese resistance. Uh, the last pass, the last pass put jump on a little bit closer. 
We're putting our mark low. We're putting our mark low, but they're going over. Stand by. Hey, Rusty, this is Ginger 3. Uh, they're changing their course a little. Let us know how they're going to go. Hey, Rusty, this is Ginger 3. One napalm, two napalms dropped, one napalm in the target area, one low on the target area, one was low on the target area, and they still insist on flying from west to east. Uh, they get a little bit more of the southern part of the target, the southern face of the target, and they can switch their strike around, flying near to 70, near to 70. Over. Oh, that is good. That is right on the ball. Company coming down from the west to the east ran into that big pocket of nips, and they probably figure there's well on to 400 of them there. So, if the attack is not coordinated, if we don't get our artillery and infantry working together, we're not going to be able to knock them out. Following a last-bit attempt by the Japanese to counterattack, the island was secured on the 6th of July. A staggering 26,000 Japanese soldiers had died in the process of defending Saipan. Guam and Tinian were the next islands to be invaded. Once again, the Japanese proved to be tough and ferocious fighters, but the Americans soon gained strongholds. Unable to resist the American onslaught, both islands were in American hands by mid-August. By now, the Japanese were having to face the harsh reality that their war in the Pacific was not going well. Indeed, the defeated General Tojo was soon to resign as Prime Minister. The American submarines were also becoming increasingly effective in sinking the Japanese merchant convoys. 50 ships a month were being sent to the bottom by 1944, and the supply of raw materials reaching Japan was approaching crisis point. A further threat to the Japanese evolved with the capture of the Marianas. Japan itself was now within striking distance for the mighty B-29 Superfortress bombers. These had been initially deployed to India and China in the spring of 1944. Random raids on Japan had been tried during the summer, but a major Japanese offensive had forced their evacuation. Airships capable of taking B-29s were hastily built in the Marianas, and the first B-29s became operational here in mid-October. 
On the 24th of November 1944, no less than 111 B-29s attacked an aero engine factory on the outskirts of Tokyo. This marked the beginning of the strategic air offensive against Japan. Meanwhile, as Nimitz prepared his fleet to support the invasion of the Philippines, MacArthur made some preliminary landings to clear the way ahead. These took place on the Malaccas and Pilau Islands, with the Leyte Gulf being the initial Philippines target. In mid-October 1944, aircraft from Admiral William Hulse's 3rd United States Fleet carried out attacks on Lusum, the main Philippines island, and Formosa. On the 20th of October, the landings in Leyte Gulf took place on a 16-mile front. The Japanese fought venomously, but to no avail. This was a momentous moment for MacArthur, for he was now honoring his pledge to the people of the Philippines, made two years previously, that he would return. At sea, however, the Japanese were by now using a new type of weapon, one which accounted for an escort carrier and three destroyers. This was the Kamikaze or Divine Wind suicide pilots who literally aimed their aircraft packed with explosives to crash into Allied warships. The kamikaze pilots themselves were volunteers for what they saw as the ultimate honor of dying for their empire. Kamikaze attacks were to plague Allied shipping for the remainder of the war. Numerous ships, both British and American, would fall victim to these divine wind attacks. The Japanese desperately continued to hold Leyte and fought recklessly. It was not until mid-December that MacArthur could make any further attempts to land on the Philippines. In January 1945, a series of landings were made on Luzon. The Marines advanced inland towards Manila, the Philippine capital. The Americans reached the outskirts of the city on the 3rd of February. But this was not going to be an easy objective to secure. The Japanese garrison had split itself over the city, using public buildings as strongholds. Time and time again they resisted, down to the last man. Orders were given to the American artillery to try and avoid damaging the city's ancient architecture. This, however, became unavoidable, and Manila was systematically reduced to rubble. The death toll was high on both sides. Japanese resistance remained as fierce as ever, even though they were completely surrounded. 
16th century citadel of Intramuros was pinpointed as being the main garrison, and this was attacked over a two-day period, reducing it to rubble. Finally, on the 3rd of March, 1945, the city of Manila was free of Japanese occupation. Almost 100,000 civilians had died as a result of Japanese brutality. Despite being defeated, the Japanese were to continue fighting in the Philippines for the remainder of the war. Meanwhile, Nimitz was focusing attention on his next two objectives, the islands of Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Both were seen as essential targets before final assault on mainland Japan. In November, the huge Pacific fleet began the offensive on Iwo Jima, bombarding the island before the amphibious assault. Iwo Jima itself is just over five miles long and is dominated by the volcanic mount Suribachi. Allied air power remorselessly pounded it, but the 21,000 Japanese defenders had constructed a network of underground bunkers and tunnels which provided ample protection. On the 17th of February 1945, further attacks were inflicted on Iwo Jima. February, the Americans launched their amphibious assault. This took place on the south coast of the island. Three United States divisions were involved. The Japanese pounded the assault craft with heavy artillery fire, but the Marines still managed to reach the beaches. American casualties, however, were heavier than expected. Thirty thousand Marines had been landed by the end of the first day. They immediately advanced inland towards the volcanic Mount Suribachi. This was no easy ride for the Marines. The fighting was ferocious. Finally, on the 14th of March, they overcame the Japanese defenses and Iwo Jima was taken. A photograph taken of the raising of the American flag on the summit of Mount Suribachi became the most famous United States image of the Pacific War. In March 1945, the American strategic bombing offensive against mainland Japan had taken on a new form. High altitude bombing by day had proved relatively ineffective. Now the bombers were loaded with incendiaries which were dropped at low level by night. These raids began not only to devastate Japan's largely wooden built cities, but also any of Japan's remaining war industries. The worst harvest of 40 years aggravated the situation still further. <laughs> 
1st of April, 1945, the Americans landed on Okinawa, the last stepping stone on the long road to mainland Japan. This time, the Japanese concentrated their defenses inland, and no less than 50,000 troops were landed on the first day. The battle to secure Okinawa would, however, last for almost three months. By this time, the Allies were holding the last of their great wartime strategic conferences at Potsdam in Germany. In April 1945, the Soviet Union had renounced its 1941 non-aggression pact with Japan, and Stalin was now ready to attack her. In Japan itself, there was now a body of opinion in favor of peace. In early June, approaches had been made to Moscow, but the reaction had been non-committal. There was still a strong war party in Japan, and the Supreme War Council voted to continue the war till the bitter end. The Allies issued a declaration to Japan. The alternatives offered were stark unconditional surrender or prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese announced that they would ignore the Potsdam Declaration because it made no mention of the Emperor. Consequently, the Western Allies decided to use the atomic bomb. On the 6th of August 1945, a B-29 called Enola Gay took off from Tilla, its target, the city of Hiroshima. Once above the city, the bomb, called the Little Boy, was dropped. It detonated at an altitude of 2,000 feet. The result was the destruction of 42 square miles of the city and the death of 80,000 people. Nagasaki suffered the same fate a few days later. But this provoked no Japanese surrender offer. There is still time but little time for the Japanese to save themselves. Also on the 9th of August, the Russians launched a massive three-pronged invasion on Manchukuo, which quickly sent the Japanese Kwantung army reeling back. 